Today's reading comes from Mark's Gospel. It's Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. And to put it in context, we've had the beginnings of Jesus' ministry and the calling of the four fishermen. And then there follows through chapters 1 and 2 a series of healing miracles and some teaching, but primarily healing miracles. And then a couple of run-ins with the religious leaders. A question about fasting, the question about the Sabbath, and it's all about those initial challenges, not in an overt, horrible way, but showing that there is a greater truth that must trump any sense of tradition or just doing things because they were written down that way, if they stand in the way of love and unity and kindness. So just before this reading, Jesus chooses the 12 disciples. And just before that, there's a large gathering of people. The crowd was so large that Jesus told his disciples to get into a boat ready for him so that the people would not crush him. He had healed many people and all those who were ill kept pushing their way to him in order to touch him. And whenever the people who had evil spirits in them saw him, they would fall down before him and scream, you are the son of God. So there we have evil spirits recognising Jesus' divinity in humanity. And our reading now talks about the contrast of how other people viewed him, specifically the teachers of the law and his own family, those who were close to him. So our reading. Then Jesus went home. Again, such a large crowd gathered that Jesus and his disciples had no time to eat. When his family heard about it, they set out to take charge of him. They were saying, he's gone mad. Some teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem were saying, he has Beelzebub in him. It is the chief of demons who gives him the power to drive them out. So Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a country divides itself into groups which fight each other, that country will fall apart. If a family divides itself into groups which fight each other, that family will fall apart. So if Satan's kingdom divides into groups, it cannot last, but will fall apart and come to an end. No one can break into a strong man's house and take away his belongings unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder his house. I assure you that people can be forgiven all their sins and all the evil things they may say. But whoever gives says evil things against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven because he has committed an eternal sin. Jesus said this because people were saying he has an evil spirit in him. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside the house and sent in a message asking for him. A crowd was sitting round Jesus and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers and your sisters are outside and they want you. Jesus answered, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He looked at the people sitting around him and said, Look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does what God wants to do, God wants him to do, is my brother, my sister, my mother. So in this little reading, we've got um, a nice sandwich of two stories. The learning by his family of what Jesus was doing and their assessment that he'd gone mad, topping and tailing the story, and then within it, the episode of Jesus talking to the religious leaders of the day. You've got a feel for his family, um, who had to ride that journey of having known him all of his life, to then see him go off, leave his profession, and the plans that they all had, consciously or subconsciously, for his life, to go off and be an itinerant preacher and healer, and to have crowds of people, and crowds of very scary people, people who were ill, deranged, um, people who were so evidently very needy, people who would come to him in a great clamour, and a great sense of almost violent pursuit, you know, that comes across in the Gospels. This wasn't a, a polite gathering. People were so completely bowled away by the miracles of Jesus. They wanted it. They wanted some healing. They wanted to get well. And pushing and shoving and all sorts of things would have gone on, no doubt, to make that happen. That's a frightening thing to see somebody that you love go through. 
and to question what on earth has happened? What's changed? Why is this person we thought we knew behaving like this? It's perfectly, perfectly understandable in human terms. And Mark isn't making any judgments per se about their behaviour. It's a journey and an illustration to all of us of the journey we need to go on about how in the works of God and in the glimpses of God, tradition and even the closest family ties have no place in setting our priorities and in defining our response. And again, we have uh, the, the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem. Mm, so the big place. Uh, and they say, yes, well, the only way in which somebody could be possibly uh, doing all these miracles and all these wonderful things is because it's a bad thing. Essentially, we've already had a conversation about healing on the Sabbath, which was a bad thing. And here we have um, somebody else casting out demons. Well, surely that's a demonic possession as well. It can't be anything good. And that's the thing that both sets of people, his parents and his uh, brothers and sisters, the whole family and the teachers of the law from Jerusalem failed to recognize that what Jesus was doing was good. Because it wasn't what they expected and it wasn't what they assumed would happen. And, you know, this is such an important lesson for life, leave aside religion and faith. But if someone is doing something that is good, then that ought to be applauded. That ought to be supported because our attitude should be that we want the best for all our brothers and sisters. We want them all to be the best people they can possibly be to be as happy as they possibly can be, to be as well and healthy as they possibly can be. That's what we should want for everybody. And our motivations ought to be to applaud and support anyone who does that. Look at what happened recently with um, uh, the first outbreak of COVID-19 and the lockdown. And here in the UK, the fact that people would stand out on a Thursday night at eight o'clock and clap and bang tins and pans in support for the NHS workers. Thank you for what you're doing and for how you're protecting us. And that kind of desire to applaud and thank those who help us, should or help other people rather, should be endemic in our behaviour. For those of us who call ourselves Christian, of course, um, we fundamentally regard all people everywhere as valuable because we know everybody is created by God and everybody is God's special child, loved, accepted, pardoned and set free. Now, whether they know that or not is a completely different story. But that's our understanding that everybody is God's creation and God loves everybody. And so our attitude to people everywhere and all the time is one that tries to knock down prejudice and injustice an attitude that tries to achieve the best for other people and to want the best for other people. And Jesus says to them those simple lessons using a, a, a powerful and uh, familiar illustration of the time about nobody can um, steal from a strong man unless they tie them up first. So then with his parents, his mother and his sister and his brothers, who, he says, are the people who I am most intimately connected with? Who are the people who I care about? Who are the people I have ties and bonds of responsibilities to? Well, I mean, he wasn't saying it wasn't them, but he does say, well, it's all of these people, all of these people who are gathered around me seeking healing, seeking to be made well, seeking to be free of their uh, possessions and their evil spirits, seeking to be free of their physical ailments, mental and physical distress. Those who need me are the ones that I spend my time with, the ones that I care for, the ones that I, um, yeah, I'm most intimately connected with. And that, too, should be the hallmark of all of us who call ourselves Christian, that we spend our time with those who need us, regardless of who they are, and regardless of where they are. It's a message of great unity. This conversation, this dialogue, this balancing act 
between doing such wonderful, wonderful good work for people in terms of restoring their lives, contrasted heavily with the scepticism and fear of those of some of those around Jesus who preferred to keep things the way they were, to assume that things were going to be the way they have always been. The good news that Jesus came to embody and to show to people is not familiar and accepted and understood and cosy. It's incredibly challenging and it's going to get people's backs up if they wish to hang on to the status quo, if they choose to believe that they understand what is right. Revolutionary things are by their very nature going to challenge people. But of course, if that challenge is based on love for all, then obviously it can be something of God. And in terms of our actions, if our actions are about loving people, caring for people, inspiring people, supporting people, then it's something good. And we should all applaud that. Applaud it in others and strive for it ourselves.